Okay, scholars. Um, this is for the California history class, and uh, also we'll use this with my environmental history class. Um, discussion would go completely different in the two classes, but uh, the material is basically the same, and it's just uh, to spark your interest here in, in, uh, in John Muir. And especially get a start with this. Uh, this is uh, for the California SU, which most of you are going to be teachers. Governor California annually shall proclaim April 21st to be John Muir Day. So, all public schools and educational institutions are encouraged to observe April 21 of each day, of each year, it's John Muir Day, and to conduct suitable commemorative exercises. And I'm having you try and Write like John Muir. Read an essay, try and write like him. Um, stressing the importance of an ecologically sound national environment placed in the quality of life for all of us. Emphasizing John Muir's significant contributions to the fostering of that awareness and the indelible mark he left on the state of California. So this is John Muir, and this is one of, uh, he became famous, famous at the end of his life, and Teddy Roosevelt comes out and wants to go camping with John Muir. And uh, so this is what we want to talk about. This guy is, uh, he's really, uh, he lives a life which is great and exemplary in so many ways. But then on the other hand, is he wrote about it in such a way. And so it's the power of writing. It's the power of uh, a writer to, uh, to become so influential in the world, and you could make a case, this would be a fun discussion, that the most important Californian for the future of the world is John Muir. I mean, his writings uh, are really uh, sort of at the center of the beginnings of this sort of conservation movement, which then has spread throughout the world and now the Green Parties and with global warming and with all sorts of issues is going to get more and more and more important. So, so how this plays out, uh, John, John Muir's importance is, is something that, you know, you guys will be spending your lives, you can discuss this, go to Yosemite and stuff. But the, uh, we'll, talk, we'll get you started today, but fascinating guy. He himself, incredibly pleasant. I've been a great John Muir fan all of my life, you know, and you, uh, you read his writings. He goes to Alaska. He's a kid's book about it, dogs to keen. He's got, he's got all sorts of just great, great. I, I've given you Windstorm in the Sierra where he climbs a tree in the midst of a storm just to ride it around. Uh, when he gets on a boat and a storm happens, he wants to be out there in it. He never wants to hide. He thinks that nature is actually where you meet reality at its most real. And so he calls himself a poetico, trampo, geologist, botanist, an ornithologist, naturalist. <laughs> He's sort of all things. And he has, the, because of these observational skills, he actually sees glaciers better than some of the scientists, most of the scientists of his era. And so we, we think of him in a scientific way too, as a, a guy who could unite art and science and literature and everything. The glacier stuff, that's just an added thing. It's really his writings, his the writings and how the writings gather around him. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And uh, at the time uh, he was writing, there's this uh, new spirit of ecology that's developing. And uh, ecology is a word developed by this guy, a uh, German biologist, Darwinian, named Heichel. And uh, this is Mount Heichel in the Evolution Range in, in the Sierra Nevada. You have this Evolution Range where there's Mount Darwin, Mount Mendel, Mount Spencer, Mount uh, 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 Fisk, Fisk, uh, yeah, and, and then you have Heichel in there. And, and uh, then, the, uh, then the John Muir Trail goes right through Evolution Valley below it. Great stuff, great stuff, man. And um, so, you know, this, this huge spirit of ecology. And so California becomes a leader in sort of thinking about ecology. We're not the only place, but we've got John Muir, plus this thing called the Sierra Club that creates, and then this, this real promotion of, hey, we have to think ecologically. And so 
So this is what we're going to talk about today, and this is this importance of John Muir. Uh, as I say, later in life, he becomes sort of famous, and there's a sort of collection of people here. This young guy is Charles Keeler, lived up in Berkeley and wrote a book called The Simple Home and advocated simple living, but living within beauty, this idea of ecology, ecology, eco is home. So it's the study of the home, it's the study of, of how to how to create a home that is well-balanced and beautiful, and then life can flourish there. And so that what Keeler wrote for his own home there in Berkeley and for the neighborhood of, of people around him is applicable to all of California, and he thinks of it that way, is that, is that we all should be thinking of creating a beautiful home in which humans can flourish along with beauty and everything else. Uh, William Keith is, uh, oh, this guy's William Keith, I think. And uh, William Keith is the painter. And then there's John here. Burroughs is from the East. He's a nature writer. I'm not a real big fan of Burroughs. I, you know, and, I don't, and I've never read Brown. So, but these three up here are the California guys. And, uh, and this is a Keith painting. And the thing that impresses everybody about California is it's just so dang beautiful. And so... Most importantly, though, it's, it's more than just beautiful. There's everywhere's beauty. There's beauty everywhere you go in the world. But gosh, California has got not only just loads of beauty, it's got some majestic things which are so outlandish. Yellowstone is the other national park. You start, Yellowstone is like, I don't know, some otherworldly Disneyland or something. But this is just pure power of nature, you know. Yosemite Valley. So um, <laughs> the fact <clears throat> that we had Yosemite Valley and then nearby we have these trees which are just the most massive trees in the world and uh, I you know go to Yosemite Valley if you've never been there you gotta go and go 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 to see these trees and to walk among them you can't to see a picture doesn't capture them at all there's uh, the there's these two types of sequoia. There's the coastal sequoia, you know, around in here. <clears throat> They're dang impressive. If you drive Highway 101 up to Humboldt and stuff like that, you can go, go in and see them. But up here in uh, the sequoia, the giant sequoia, the sequoia gigantium, these guys, you go up to Vizalia or, you know, and up into here and cross around in there. This, these guys here, these groves of trees are just amazing. And uh, they're just all around you. Just keep walking, and uh, you just, uh, uh, you know, amazing. You camp up there, wander around. Now, uh, we've talked about the Indians being pushed out. And with the Indians pushed out in 1850, 51, here in this southern Sierra, uh, you got loads, of, you know, you had the miners coming in, and, and then they had interesting people. <laughs> this is a guy, Harp, or Tharp, excuse me. Hale Tharp, this is a fallen tree, and he, he lives in it. And, you know, he's a hermit kind of guy, just hanging out up there. John Muir meets him, you know, other people meet him. And, uh, and so he gets some people like him showing up there. And then other people start, they think it's sort of entrepreneurial or fun, you know, and then they start cutting down these trees. You know, to do the, you know, they actually peel the bark off of one and, send it back to World's Fairs and such back east. Here's a community called the Kawea Colony up among the trees. They were sort of a, uh, they, they named the trees after Karl Marx and people like that. Um, they were, uh, you know, gonna develop a, a, a community, but the idea of all these different people were moving up into there and the, the what was going to happen to these trees? What was going to happen to Yosemite uh, is a big issue. And so Abraham Lincoln uh, signs the Yosemite Grant, which gives what is now, remember, we don't elect the, uh, what was Indian land, <clears throat> the United States does not say is Indian land, it's federal land. So Yosemite Valley and these areas of the big trees are technically federal land. And so as the President of the United States during the Civil War, Lincoln gives them to the state of California as a sort of protective, you know, state park. And this guy uh, here, 
Galen Clark. He was like Hale Tharp, uh, sort of a guy who just sort of lived up around, you know, sort of a loner character. And they um, named him Guardian, you know. And he's, I don't know, he's supposed to sort of wander up there as a ranger until they figure out what to do with this state park. And it's during, during these years as a state park, uh, 18, uh, Muir arrives in 1868. And, uh, you know, look at that guy. You know, uh, you know look at those eyes. This is, <laughs> this is the, these are the guys who, who changed the world, you know. And he writes a lot. Uh, he takes notes. He has his notebook and stuff like that. And he puts his, uh, you know, he collects all this stuff. And later on, he writes. And he writes magazine articles. And they put things together. And this book is, is one of, uh, I think was actually published as his first book. But it's uh, great stories. He's, he goes into the Yosemite. And he works. He's a sheep farmer. He works at the lumber mill. He does, does sort of stuff. And and, uh, and uh, he's just fascinated by the place, okay? Now, this publisher who published his work, this guy, Robert Underwood Johnson, you know, Indiana guy, lives in New York City, Quaker background, and he becomes a big promoter of Muir's writings. And so, you know, Muir's not that big a deal, but he's got a guy behind him who is saying, this is, this is not only a great writer, he has the whole, he's the whole package. Muir is the spirit, the goals, the ideals, everything. And so he, uh, he uses this, uh, his influence on Muir to uh, a driving force behind the creation of the National Park. Okay, you want to take Yosemite away from the state actually shrink its size, but then make it a national park, and the big trees make it a national park. And then um, uh, this idea of Johnson is credited with uh, writing this bill for the, the creation of the national park, but then Muir dedicated the book Yosemite to Johnson in 1889, camping out with Muir in Soda Springs. Uh, Johnson also encouraged Muir to start an association to help protect the Sierra Club. And so the Sierra Club, or help protect the Sierra, and so the Sierra Club gets created in uh, 1892. Sierra Club uh, began as really a club, man. It's like we all talk about these progressive clubs. This would be folks that are college educated, uh, most of them living in the Bay Area, a lot of them Berkeley professors and Stanford. This is David Starr Jordan, he's, uh, he is, becomes the uh, very, very dynamic president of Stanford. Joseph LeConte, one of the uh, first professors at the new uh, UC Berkeley that's created there in 1868. And uh, his brother, uh, John LeConte, Joseph become these, and Joseph actually leads in the 1870s these student groups where they would ride there, they'd get on horses in Berkeley and ride across the valley up into the Sierra and up into Yosemite and they meet John Muir in his journals. He talks about meeting John Muir. And, and so just, uh, you know, this is the Sierra Club. They begin to be people who want to protect the Sierras, who look out for it. And then the Sierra Club goes on to steroids when uh, what's called the Hetch Hetchy water uh, issue develops. And what San Francisco, because San Francisco is just a peninsula there, you see there's, there's no water out there that you can just build a big city. It's the worst place for a big city. Stupid. And stupid, 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 as my wife would say. So uh, what you want to do is, is uh, bring water out to this peninsula so that you can build a big city there. And so you uh, take water from Hetch Hetchy, which is just north of Yosemite Valley, another beautiful valley, uh, but you're going to dam it, fill it with water, and bring water up here. There's a Pulgas Water Temple that you can go visit on Highway uh, 280 that shoots down the middle of that. And then there's some, uh, the, uh, the uh, San Juan, uh, what do they call it? <laughs> the, that big fault, the earthquake fault. Ah, I forget what it is, but the big earthquake fault goes through there, and you can actually see the 
dips and so you can put, you can store water there in those earthquake faults. So uh, what you have is a destruction of this beautiful valley. And so the Sierra Club, John Muir, rises up, becomes a lobbying organization of extreme, extreme importance and continues to be a lobbying organization of extreme importance. But at the same time, it was a place for climbing in the mountains. You see these women here, you know, you know, climbing women, and then these guys, and, and these are, you know, half of them are college professors and stuff like that. When you go to the Sierra, you know, you look down the, Mount Whitney's named after a college professor. Mount Brewer was a college professor. And then you have, you go on down, Williamson, I think, is a college professor. So a lot of, a lot of college professors up there get their, you know, Ritter, Ritter is uh, a German geologist or something, gets his name. So all these mountains are not named after, like, Indian things and stuff. They're named after, after this, this class of progressive people who are, who are you know, going to manage and save and protect and appreciate the, the Sierra. This is called the Sierra Cup, which the Sierra Club developed. And they're, they're, <laughs> they're really, if you have hot stuff in them, back in the 70s, we all carried them, and they, were, they were, weren't exactly the best. And then, of course, they were the idea that you could just dip into the water, which you cannot do anymore. I give you the video of Ansel Adams. Ansel Adams, these early members of the Sierra Club, plays the violin, gets on the board. He's a very prominent character, just very interesting. And uh, one of the things that happens that makes the Sierra Club so famous, so powerful, is that David Brower uh, became, he rose up through the system, through, he has a kid, you know, and then on in, into the Sierra Club, and then becomes like its secretary and as its secretary, he starts publishing uh, Ansel Adams' photographs in these big, big books like this, okay? Yosemite and the Sierra Nevada, photographs by Ansel Adams, text. She just lifts this text by John Muir, and um, um, Brower starts to create these, what became a thing, coffee table books. You know, coffee table books weren't that big a thing back, you know, these big books full of beautiful pictures and text. Well, Brower helps create that, and Brower becomes this leader of the Sierra Club. Eventually, these two break. This is a good biography. Um, the, uh, uh, Brower becomes more and more and more radical in terms of uh, lobbying and also pushing for uh, eco-terrorism, where you actually blow up dams and stuff like this. And, and actually, uh, Earth First is his, uh, I think, the organization he was head of when he died. But the issue is, is that there's lots of stuff in California. Our resources, our, our beauty is being destroyed by this growth and managing the growth and figuring out how to manage growth. Um, this uh, Charles Scammon, you know, down in Baja, they have Scammon's uh, Lagoon and such, which is this uh, Magdalena Bay, which is where, I'm pretty sure it's that. Is it, is it? Might be. Oh, gosh. I've forgotten some. I should use notes. Um, but the thing is, is, is uh, it's a good book, uh, this book on the whales. And, and, but it's, you know, he's talking about how to actually promote the killing of whales on the West Coast. And so, you know, what are we going to do about whales? Trees. This is a Torrey Pines tree. And, and it's a, it only grows on Santa Rosa Island and then the Torrey Pines State Park. And so, you know, uh, Ellen Scripps and, and this guy Tory, uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna protect this this tree. And so there's things that need to be protected. And we need to we need to take California and 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 make it better. The, the first eucalyptus craze that built putting all these eucalyptus trees everywhere up and down the coast was so that we could actually hydrate the soil. That's the dominant reason. Hydrate that these are fast growing plants that'll grab the fog out of the air and and hydrate the soil in sort of a natural way to bring about a better, more beautiful place, but also a place where humans can flourish better. And of course, then we also move into this, expands into a number of directions of not only conservation, but setting aside parkland because people, people need to walk around. They need to feel nature. They need to be in nature. They can't just be in these cities over here. So San Diego gets its uh, Horton had declared this 
huge city park in San Diego. Golden Gate Park in San Francisco is its great park. And then this is Griffith Park in Los Angeles. Those are our three great urban parks. And so this idea of, you know, so for the progressive era up through World War II, it's doing a lot. Sierra Clubs at the sort of beginnings of it. And then also after World War II with uh, much, when the growth is really growing, that's when the Sierra Club and David Brower and these coffee table books really become prominent and the protections that had been done with Griffith Park and Golden Gate Park and Balboa Park help, you know, keep the park there even as the city was growing, growing, growing. The greatest uh, event that sort of like regathered everybody's attention was the Santa Barbara oil spill. And um, part of the reason for this is, is that color TV had just been developed and so and then where in the world do all of these people from the East Coast and Germany and places like that, all these newsmen, where do they want to go? They want to go to Santa Barbara where it's sunny in January and February. And so just millions of newsmen descend on this place, start photographing how this oil uh, from these derricks, um, it's actually a natural spill that they had opened up, begin to just decimated, especially Anacapa Island, you know, some parts of Santa Cruz Island, the coast up there. And, and so you get a, a, uh, an event here on the, in the Santa Barbara Channel, which gathers the attention of the world. And then it was used by, especially like uh, some folks out of UC Santa Barbara to propose what becomes like this uh, declaration of Environmental Rights, okay? All people have the right to an environment capable of sustaining life and promoting happiness. This is uh, actually sort of a, uh, you know, this where you take the Declaration of Independence and you reword it. It's meant to be yelled. If we were all in class, I'd have you all read it together and yell it out. So yell it out at your, your computer. All people have the right to an environment capable of sustaining life and promoting happiness, okay? The accumulated actions of the past become destructive of this right. Men now living have the further right to repudiate the past for the benefit of the future. This is a document declaring, hey, we're going to put this away, start new. This is actually not very conservative of ideas. It's very radical of new ideas, okay? Moved by the environmental disaster in Santa Barbara Channel to think and act in national and world terms. We submit to these charges. We have littered the world, we've encroached, we've stripped the forest, we've done all, we've defiled the lakes and rivers, we've done all of this stuff. It's much grander than just Santa Barbara. It's about all over the world, especially America, recognizing that the ultimate remedy for these fundamental problems is found in man's mind, and we're going to fix it. Not sure that's possible. Uh, we call on societies and their governments to recognize and implement the following principles. Okay, and so they want to, we need an ecological consciousness. And most importantly is, uh, you know, renewed idea of community, uh, less individualism, more in community. And then uh, uh, we want to redefine progress toward an emphasis on long-term quality rather than immediate quantity. Yeah, a lot of good, great stuff in this. And, uh, Especially this emphasis on the world as if it were your backyard, okay? But we propose a revolution in conduct toward the environment, which is rising and the world's built again. Granted that the ideas and institutions long established are not easily changed yet today. That's a line from the Declaration of Independence. Yet today is the first day of the rest of our lives. And uh, most, uh, probably the biggest issue is here is that he wants to sort of diminish the notion of private property and think in terms of community because private property uh, often these are the folks that destroy uh, the environment. So soon after the Santa Barbara oil spill and this sort of worldwide uh, fervor, fervor about uh, environmental rights, uh, we established temporarily in 1972 the Coastal Commission, which was the leading idea in the world. It's a government going to take 
and control its coast. And this was extended in 1976. And it's to protect, conserve, and restore, and enhance the environment of the California coastline. And especially like our campus, we cannot close it off. We have to have public access to the beach. Go East Coast, drive the East Coast. You don't get access to the beach like you get in California. You don't get these beautiful views on the East Coast like you get in California. You don't get a lot of stuff on the East Coast like you get in California because we now have a Coastal Commission who came at a time where that growth was starting and you can see the big tall things down in Coronado and stuff like that where, where those were those kind of things were shut down so that our our coastline here is not filled with these 30-story hotels and stuff like that. Why? Because we have a coastal commission that inhibits people's individual rights, corporate rights, to do what they want. They have to submit to what are public rights and responsibilities. All right. Uh, we're down the road a long way from this, and I thought I'd just point out that just recently this thing, the Nature Conservancy, is actually turning that on its head because the Nature Conservancy is a private organization funded by private, very, 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 very rich people. And these rich, 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 rich people are buying up properties to protect them, but privately. And so uh, Point Conception, four miles on each side of Point Conception is being, is now saved. That was just done a couple of years ago. Most of Santa Cruz Island is owned by the nature company. You can't go visit. You have to, you know, you have to get special permission to go even land. On. You can anchor there, but you can't land because these guys are really protected. We want to do what we want with this. Okay, there's large sections now of this land in here, which have been given by uh, the old Irvine Company people to... Um, Oh, the guy who successfully bought the Irvine Company. I don't know. The guy that was super rich real estate developer along behind Laguna Beach and all of that is now owned by the Nature Company, been devoted there. Now, Santa Catalina Island, that's also privately protected by, the, by a, a, a Wrigley, um, Santa, Quita, Santa Catalina Island Conservancy created by the Wrigley family that owns the island and still controls the company controls the conservancy, but they're dedicated to cons conservation. And national parks have taken over Anacapa and that part there, and also Santa Barbara Island. It's all national parks now. National and state parks, of course, are all along the coast here too. And then even with the, uh, the national park now owns uh, Santa Rosa Island too, the national park. And they protect it, it's hard to get out there, you know. Uh, the, the goal is not heavy tourism. The goal is protection. And then, uh, interestingly, the Navy, the United States Navy, their consciousness has been raised. So they, uh, San Miguel has this really interesting relationship between the Navy and the national parks. And then it's San Clemente Island. Very much, even though, you know, bomb it and stuff like that, they practice San Nicolas Island. You, you get out there and there's... Um, a lot of protections. They've got a lot of people protecting those islands too. So this is the story of conservation in California, but it is, it's a lead story around the world. And who is the sort of center piece of all this? It's John Muir. And it's still his writings, his writings that are so powerful, so beautiful about responsibility and, and how we should think of ourselves as part of nature rather than above nature and, and just... Uh, you know, beautiful stuff. So I'm having you read and try and write like John Muir.